This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the ASUS Republic of Gamers, or ROG, or ROG, however you want to say it, Strix SCAR 15. A lot of names there, huh? So uh, this has quickly become one of my favorite gaming laptops. I'm kind of crushing on it at the moment. Now, I do like gaming laptops in general, but this ticks so many of the boxes for what you really want in a higher-end gaming laptop. You've got AMD Zen 3 Ryzen 5000 CPUs. This one has the Ryzen 9 5900HX overclockable CPU. You have NVIDIA RTX 3080 16 gigabyte graphics inside, running at 130 watts, which isn't too bad. You've got a QHD wide gamut, 165 hertz display, an optical mechanical keyboard, and more. We are going to look at it now. So first, because there's the Rogue Strix and the Strix SCAR in the 15-inch size, not in the 17-inch size, no SCAR in the 17-inch. Let's just talk about what the difference is. We have the SCAR edition, which is the more expensive and has the higher-end configurations available. It starts at $19.99, so it's a few hundred dollars more than the non-SCAR. Uh -huh. Beyond those differences of cosmetics, which means this one has supposedly a little brighter LEDs. I don't know, whatever. They, they have lots of R RGB bling on them anyway. I, if you want the QHD panel, it's only available on the SCAR. If you want the highest end configurations, basically the 3080 for your GPU, that's only available on the SCAR. The regular model, just the Strix, has 3060s and 3070s. This one is 3070s and 3080s for the configuration. So that's the important thing. And if you like the optical mechanical keyboard, then that's only on the SCAR. All right, we got that part down. So Ryzen inside, always a good thing these days, even with Intel 11th generation H45 CPUs coming soon enough, it looks like. I have a feeling that Ryzen is still going to have the lead in CPU performance, particularly for productivity work, not just everyday productivity, but content creation, where it just, any Adobe product just flies with this. Nice enough to have. For gaming, of course, it's very good too. It depends on how well it's optimized. Far Cry obviously has been optimizing for Intel in the past. Things like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, they have a big AMD Ryzen splash screen to give you a hint that they've done a good job optimizing for that. RTX 3000 series graphics from GeForce line, so that's a good thing. Obviously, it's the latest generation. And it speaks to the fact, by the way, that yes, these are still hard to find. It took me months of hunting this, actually, to find one at a retail store. This is not a review loaner from ASUS, by the way. And there are shortages of both Ryzen CPUs and NVIDIA latest gen GPUs. Hopefully, that will ease so all of you can find one and without having to place, pay scalping prices. But. In terms of the GPU in here, it's not as high wattage as the Alienware M15R4 or the MSI GE66, which are the competitors to this, which means 15-inch powerful higher-end gaming laptops that are not uber skinny. This is not one of those MSI stealth kind of deals or something like the Zephyrus G15 from ASUS that we reviewed that are meant to be ultra-thin and also on this, happen to be on the game. So... Not bad though, 130 watts with boost is pretty darn good. But if you're somebody who wants their GPU to be absolutely maxed, this probably isn't gonna be the one for you. There's also no MUX switch, which means a little hardware switch that switches between dedicated GPU mode only and switchable graphics. This is switchable graphics all the time. Unless you plug in an external monitor using the USB-C port, which supports DisplayPort 1.4. So what does that mean to you? Typically five to 10 frames in games. Not a lot more probably important for you eSports players. And speaking of you eSports players, there is also a full HD 300 hertz panel available, so that should be full sRGB coverage. So the gamut's not bad, not as wide as the one that we have. So they have both options for you out there. For those of you shopping the 3080 model, they do sell it both with the 8 gig or the 16 gigs of VRAM option. The base model, the 1999 one, is actually a 3080 with 8 gigs. Then there's a middle model, which is the 3070. Gets confusing, doesn't it? And then the top 3080 with the 16 gigs. In terms of upgradability and stuff that you care about, if you're into a performance gaming laptop, we have two RAM slots. Yay! So those of you who are turned, turned off by the ASUS Zephyrus G15 single RAM slot with the other portion of RAM solder to the motherboard. Not an issue here. It's DDR4, 3200 megahertz. Maximum would be 64 gigs, and you can get it with 16 or 32 from the factory. Ours is the higher end config, so it has 32. And you have a one terabyte NVMe M.2 SSD for your boot drive, and there's a second slot in case you want to add a second drive on board.
So good stuff there. It's an Intel Wi-Fi 6 card, no surprises. And also, and we'll take a look at the internals later, but happy, happy, unlike Alienware currently for their Intel offerings, you just unscrew the bottom cover, being careful of those two little RGB LED ribbons for the front lighting, and you have access to everything. You want to repaste it or whatever, yes, you can do that. Clean your fans easily enough. You might not want to repaste it, though, because ASUS is doing a cool thing with their rogue laptops, and that is putting liquid metal on the CPU to help even more with cooling, even though Ryzen runs cooler than Intel. I would never say no to liquid metal. So that's on the CPU only, which is the one that typically needs it more, not on the GPU. In terms of looks and build quality, this is quite different from the Zephyrus G15 that we reviewed, which is pretty classy looking and metal clad all over magnesium aluminum alloy. This one looks a little more gamery to be sure, especially with all the RGB bling going on. Of course, you can turn off or set to a single color if you want to look a little more chill. Uh, this one does have an aluminum lid on board. I think it looks pretty nice. It has the usual overhanging butt, shall we say, that Alienware started, and it turned out to be a good idea, clearly, because a lot of manufacturers are doing that now, throwing the ventilation out further out the back so it clears the display, another improvement over the Zephyrus G15, where the hot air does blow on the display. Um, so metal on the top, it looks pretty nice. You've got the little dot holes that ASUS likes to do, but there's no mylar or colored effects underneath those dots. It just is what it is. The ROG logo, uh, the ASUS logo rather, lights up on the lid. Again, your choice. You can turn that off or choose what colors you like. Also on the body, they have this little decorative piece that's magnetically held in place. And they give you three different choices in the box. You got your light gray, you got your kind of black, and you have a translucent smoke one to match the keyboard deck translucency. If you don't like those, you can spray paint it. If you want to get more creative, they actually have the 3D printing file so you can print your own. The keyboard deck on this, it gets interesting and probably I would say pretty cool. That is plastic, but there's a reason for that because you can see the diagonal line that cuts across it. Part of it is translucent smoked brownish, grayish kind of, so you can sort of see the internal. So obviously they need to use plastic for that. So the rest of the keyboard deck is plastic. It looks nice enough. Um, but it does show fingerprints a lot. The lid's not too bad, but the keyboard deck... And the bottom unremovable plate is also plastic. It has a lot of ventilation holes. That's something that I'd like to see. I know for some laptops we've seen in 2021 in the gaming sector, they don't have as much ventilation open as this one does. So good that. And as usual, we have side and rear exhaust vents. So overall, the build quality feels pretty tanky. I like what they did with the lid. It feels fairly rigid. I mean, if you grab it and torsion it, yes, it will move some, but it's pretty thick, it's pretty rigid, and we have very narrow bezels. It's like 85% screen to body ratio there. There is still a big chin at the bottom. Yes, they could have put a 16 by 10 aspect ratio display, and they're like Lenovo's done with their Legion 5 Pro, but well, they didn't, did they? For the rest of the RGBs, there is the RGB underlighting, I guess you would call it, along the front edge, extends a little bit to the sides. This is kind of smart. I mean, putting it where you, the user, can see it instead of a lot of it facing back, where you just maybe annoy other people or whatever with it. But it's programmable. You can set the colors on it. And there's a new under display lighting, you know, where it, it cuts up on, on the, the lid. So it's kind of like having a little reading light or something there. It casts a little bit of light. You can control the brightness on it. So, you know, if you're playing in the dark, it won't all be too bright. And the keyboard, of course, is per key RGB programmable. Now let's talk about the keyboard, which is one of the things that's Sets us apart from many gaming laptops out there, but not all. Alienware is now offering a mechanical keyboard too on their laptops. But and, and if you get the base Strix, you don't get this, but you've got an optical mechanical keyboard. So it uses optical sensors to sense when you press the key down and they're mechanical keys. 1.9 millimeters of travel, which is pretty deep by today's laptop standards. And it feels good. Now I don't actually use a mechanical keyboard on my desk or gaming or anything normally. Uh, the travel is too deep for me and uncomfortable, but this feels still like a laptop keyboard with that extra little tactile click. And after I got used to it for two days, it seemed weird to use other membrane keyboards. So I guess I, so I'm kind of surprised, but I actually really like it a lot. I type great on it. It's great for gaming, all that sort of thing. If you're worried about the noise, I know there was a Big deal made about how noisy these switches are. Not really, not compared to a desktop keyboard or something like that, which is really super loud. I, I use this with other people in the room. I said, is my typing bothering you? And they said, like, what typing? 
you know, granted there was a TV on in the room, it wasn't silent, it wasn't the library, so I leave it up to you. We'll, we'll play it now and compare it to a traditional mechanical desktop keyboard so you can hear what it sounds like to get an idea. The trackpad on this is an MS Precision trackpad. It works great. It's pretty good size. And another Strix SCAR special that you don't get on the regular Strix is ASUS's beloved, they love to do this, turning the trackpad into a number pad. So you, know, you press and hold that num lock and you can switch it to a number pad. If you're using an external mouse, you might find this handy. I don't know. It's there for you if you do. So in terms of ports, the selection is pretty good here. You don't get Thunderbolt 3 because AMD and maybe someday we will reasons. Anyway, you have one USB-C port that's out the rear, and that is Gen 2. You have USB-A 3.2 Gen 1 ports, three of those, so you're all set with that. You've got HDMI 2.0B. If you need DisplayPort, you can get that via USB-C. Just get a dongle, so you're good if you need DisplayPort, if you want to do VR or something like that. We have Gigabit Ethernet as well, of course, a headphone jack, no micro SD card slaughter. You know, instead we have the stupid Keystone too. I don't know anybody who likes this thing. It's a little NFC device that you stick in the big old hole in the side and it just saves all of your settings like for your lighting and all that kind of thing. Who needs this? It's like, what do you have three ASUS Rogue laptops and you're going to go between them and save your settings? We could have had an SD card slot or a second USB-C port, something more useful. Well, maybe someday they'll give up on this Keystone, but not yet. The speakers on this are excellent. I was really surprised at how good they are. I mean, rivaling a 16-inch MacBook Pro, which somehow always manages to be the winner. You've got two 4-watt speakers, and then you have two 2-watt two tweeters. So four speakers all together in stereo with Dolby Atmos software. So you get Dolby for headphones for free. You don't have to go buy it. And that creates 5.1.2 virtual sound if you want. Likewise, it can try to create that sound on the speakers. It's got bass. It's got volume. It sounds full. Dialogue clarity is still there. It's nice. Can you hear them though? What about the fan noise and all that stuff that goes with gaming laptops? Pleasant surprise here. It wasn't as loud as I thought it would be given the many gaming laptops I review. When they're very powerful and they're 15 inches, they sound like Dyson vacuum cleaners usually, you know? And even compared to the Zephyrus G15, which has a lower wattage GPU and even a lower wattage Ryzen CPU inside, this is a lot quieter. I mean, the G15 in comparison does sound like a Dyson, even though it's not the loudest gaming laptop out there by any means. But when I test this for performance and for gaming, I put it in turbo mode, which is your choice. But I say the only choice really, unless you want to do manual mode with ROG laptops. Why? Because it sets both the CPU and the GPU to high performance modes, ramps up the fan profile to try to keep it cool, whereas performance mode doesn't try as hard to keep it so cool. And it overclocks the GPU a bit. Not by a super lot. You might still want to tinker with that yourself using MSI Afterburner or something. But anyway, even in turbo mode, playing Assassin's Creed Valhalla or Cyberpunk, very demanding games, you'll hear the fan, but it's not that loud. And it's not high-pitched in the least. It's kind of like the waterfall running somewhere peacefully along instead of like a, yeah! So, again, this is a little hard to convey using our studio microphones or anything like that, but as gaming laptops go when gaming with AAA titles, pretty well managed. I could still hear the speakers to enjoy them, but we do have headphone jack in case you don't want to have to deal with that. Well, so if noise is pretty well controlled, how about heat and how about performance? It's Ryzen and it has liquid metal. Right there, that's going to help a lot. Now, we've still seen manufacturers kind of screw up some Ryzen designs a little bit and have them still run hot. And we're not talking Mac M1 chip level of efficiency, but it is a 7 nanometer chip. And I was pleased to see, again, playing those AAA titles on ultra settings or whatever equivalent those games have, because some of them use different names for them. Um, that CPU temperatures were typically 80 to 85 centigrade. So that's nice without any frame limiting or anything like that. That's pretty darn good. I didn't even bother with manual fan curves and all that sort of thing because that's acceptable to me, really. I mean, and if you come from the world of Intel, it's absolutely delightful where you're facing 99 degrees centigrade and thermal throttling and breaking out your undervolting tools and all that sort of thing. It's very good. The GPU on this, like I said, is 130 watts. And when playing those AAA titles, most of the time I saw it pushing up right at 130 watts using dynamic boost 
2.0 on this. So performance is good. It's not the maximum that you're going to get out of a GPU. Like I said, you'll find some that are even higher. I mean, Alienware pushes it to 165 watts. GPUs for AAA titles are very important for performance. If you want the maximum you can possibly get, you probably still want to go for something with an even higher wattage GPU, even if you're suffering with a lower, less efficient GPU going along with it. But overall, kicks butt. Any title, ultra settings, ray tracing on, it's there for you. The display on this, we have the QHD panel, which is the same exact panel that's used in the Zephyrus G15 that we reviewed, and that's good. I was hoping it would be because I was very impressed with that display. 165 hertz refresh rate. They claim three millisecond response times. It's more like five, but that's still excellent. It's a lovely looking display and it's pretty good color calibrated. Um, you've got ASUS's Armory Crate software, so you can choose from different color profiles. I find that the default profile is the best. Vivid's pretty nice too. Reduces the contrast ever so slightly. You can see the metrics on screen, but we are talking full P3 coverage and 90% of Adobe RGB and of coal of course, full sRGB. So if you're getting this for content creation and where color accuracy and wide gamut do matter to you, yes. If you're just playing games and watching media, you're gonna love the way it looks. It's good. What can I say? And QHD is just the perfect pairing for the RTX 3000 and for this CPU because let's face it, 1080p is kind of like not hard enough. And that's not really where you see the RTX 3000 GPU shining. Pretty much a 2000 GPU can do fine at full HD resolution, but 2K, sharper looking, nice, not too much of a performance hit, good. There's no IPS light bleed on ours, nor was there on the Zephyrus G15. They're really knocking it out of the park with that and controlling light bleed. I wish Alienware could take a lesson from that, maybe even MSI. Um, by the way, speaking of the display, AMD has a power saving feature. I think it's called Variabrite. Go into the AMD Radeon settings and turn that off. Otherwise, you're going to unplug this laptop and you're going to say, it looks like five-year-old faded Pop-Tarts. What happened to my display? It's a stupid thing. Why does AMD do this? Reducing the brightness I get, reducing the color saturation should be an offense that you can be put in jail for. It's just horrible. So. It sounds pretty good so far, right? Mm -hmm. So what's a con? Obviously, this is what ASUS is doing with all their gaming laptops. There's no webcam. You have two-way noise-canceling microphones built into this laptop, but there's no webcam. So be it that most built-in webcams are pretty cap crappy these days, buying and using an external USB webcam is okay by me, but I know some of you are really bothered by this. If that's the case, this is not your laptop. Obviously, it just isn't there. So what else could be wrong with this? Well, battery life usually sucks on gaming laptops, right? But not with Ryzen, right? And that's the benefit, I suppose, of this always having Optimus switchable graphics and having AMD software that is pretty powerful. Well, in fact, you can even put in iGPU mode only. You don't really have to, though. Switchable is good enough. This thing has a 90 watt hour battery. That's pretty darn huge. And battery life unplugged, doing productivity work, streaming video, that sort of thing, not playing games, which you want to do plugged in for best performance anyway. Battery life on this is typically nine hours. Wow. And now if you kick in that dedicated graphics for whatever you're doing, if you're doing Premiere or something, obviously it's going to be shorter run times. And we do these tests at 200 nits of display brightness. The laptop comes with a 240 watt charger, which is relatively compact, which is probably like most of Asus chargers these days. It can get pretty toasty to the touch. This happens with gaming laptop chargers sometimes. I've not had one burn up yet, so that is what it is. One thing that I will call out Asus for though, is the fact that this software image on this, and this product is even though you couldn't get one to save your life, but it's technically been out for a couple of months now. It's still shipping with Windows 2004, so it's a version behind. Okay, no big deal, you can update it, but all the drivers and stuff, this was very cutting edge when it came out. It was the first of its kind in a lot of ways for this combination of hardware and side. And the drivers were, mm, uh, what word can I use that won't offend anybody? They were junk. Okay, some of them. So you got to run the MySUSE updater and update all your drivers and then run Windows Update. But some of those are handled through Windows Update, those drivers. Before that, don't even bother installing your software or benchmarking or anything because the thing is just cracky until you do those and then it runs beautifully and stably. So why ASUS hasn't updated their software image so you can bypass some of these growing pains that they had months ago? I don't know.
All right, to take the bottom cover off, Phillips head screws, the ones along the front edge, which is facing this way at the moment, are shorter, so just remember that when you put it back together. Uh, the clips are tenacious, and you have to follow the path around to get them off, and the two ribbon cables that connect the front lights are connected here. So if you don't feel like disconnecting them, well, just rest it like so. But here's the speaker drivers right there for the bigger speakers. You can see that's a good size. This is the 90 watt hour battery that I'm pretty much blocking your view of right now. There we go. And the rest of the internals are, well, right here are our two RAM slots. We have some heat tape over them, reflective heat tape, but they are in there. So it's good to see that we have that. So notice over here we have the CPU and the GPU, heatsink and the fans, all available to us. So the CPU is here, and notice they've used a nickel heatsink. Why? Because liquid metal eats or interacts with copper, and it's, it's a pain in the neck. So if you use nickel, then you won't have that problem. So good job there, Asus. The boot M.2 SSD is here, a fast NVMe SK Hynix is in ours, one terabyte. Here's your second slot if you want to put a second SSD in here. And I'm not seeing a Wi-Fi card here anywhere, so my assumption is that it connects to the underside of the motherboard. So that's the ASUS Rogue Strix SCAR 15 for 2021. Boy, does it check a lot of boxes. Like I said, you've got the latest Ryzen processors inside faster than anything anybody else is offering, except for maybe, you know, the M1 chip, different can of worms that one though. You've got fast RTX 3000 graphics up to the 3080 with 16 gigs of VRAM. You've got a QHD display option, a mechanical keyboard, a good selection of ports on here, USB-C at least. Uh, as I said, no webcam though. That's, that's kind of a ding for some folks. The software load out of the box is hot garbage, so you must update it before you make any decisions about it. Uh, but overall, they have done a very good job here. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos, and then hit the notification bell so you know about them.